Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. One of the things that I think is key here, and I'm going to refer back to my studies here, um, we have uh, the differentiation between Sharia and administrative systems. Mm. And he introduced, Al Mahmoud introduces another dimension of the issue of ruling by Allah's laws. Because what's happened is that some, that we know the Takfiris, the Khawari, mm. for example, the Khawari um, ideology, but they come from two angles. Either holding that every system devised by authority be deemed as ruling by other than the Sharia and therefore impermissible. Or on the other um, end of the spectrum, assuming belief that an authority can justifiably administer legislation with the aim of benefits in society based on stating it's committing to Islam when in actuality it's not. So there's two extremes within which to, to highlight. He says that uh, Al Mahmoud mentions here. He says both groups have misunderstood the issue and asserts the necessity of differentiating between systems that contravene the Sharia and those that accord with it. So he refers to Sheikh Ashtankiti, who drew attention to this. And he referred to the, the, the example of Umar ibn al-Khattab being the first to institute a prison service in Mecca, as well as devising an administrative system to maintain a record of army personnel. Now, well, how does that stand with those with the Khariji extreme understanding? That Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second Khalifa, yeah. was able to dis differentiate and, and provide administrative structures that didn't contravene or conflict with the Sharia. No. So these are two different elements here. Now, I'm mentioning this. Why am I mentioning this? Because we're talking about knowledge. We're talking about what needs to be... Um, understood and dis differentiated between information and the problems that it can cause. So we see the knowledge and the, the wisdom of Umar ibn al-Fatab who had the deen to be able to implement what was required at the time. But one thing that we see that we shouldn't confuse this with, and it's highlighted here, is that we should, this must not be confused or mistaken with secularism. And we're mm -hmm. going to touch upon that very shortly, Carly, because some will say, okay, differentiating between the Sharia and administrative systems, it sounds like you're talking about secularism. No, mm -hmm. we're not talking about secularism. And you, no one will accuse Umar ibn al-Fatab, mm -hmm. the second caliph of Islam, uh, of, of bringing secularism into the deen in that instance. But we, see a, we do see a liberal perspective here. For example, uh, an academic called um, Dr. Shahe, his liberal perspective is where, where he said this, there is no enmity between secularism and religion. The enmity is between secularism, uh, secularism and the clerics. And that was quite interesting that he said mm. that, to try and say, no, secularism is something that can go hand in hand with uh, the Islamic apparatus. Mm. And we, as we've seen, there is conflict with that um, when you see some of the more liberal societies that, that come about. So, I'm moving quickly. Why? Because there's so much to cover around this particular um, element here, which I think is very, very important. And I said to you that I was going to move on to a macro context in, um, in this instance. So move, we spoke, remember last week we spoke about two weeks ago, you mentioned something very interesting where we were saying that students of knowledge should come back to their societies as emissaries, mm. okay? They should come back as conveyors of the knowledge, um, applying it within the context of the societies that they live in. But I'm going to say something quite controversial here, because I was thinking about it today, but so I'm going to throw mm. it at you. Okay, I'm ready right, to We've seen now mm. that we know that Malcolm X mm. spoke about house negroism, okay, where, you, where the, the, the slave will say when his, his master was sick, are we sick, okay? Mm. The master would be sick, but the slave, the house negro, would say, are we sick, such was mm. his deference to his master. Mm. And we've spoken previously about this... Um, some some of us attaching ourselves to the politics of our scholars, okay, and 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 to the to the to the um, I think to the what's the word I'm looking for, to the neglect of our own local um, situations and environments. So, for mm. example, when we were looking at we discussed this George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, what was happening in the state, um, everyone rising up and speaking against it, and then you always have from within the Muslims and Salafis particularly those who were chastised and condemn those Muslims. Fellow Muslims, fellow co-religionists of speaking up on these causes because these individuals are not Muslim and those who speak in, in favour of it are black nationalists. But then when it becomes anything to do with particular scholars that they are attached to or particular Muslim or Arab regions that they, um, their scholars are attached to, then you see them involved in these internecine disputes, discussions that can go on for years and to the neglect of their immediate socio-religious, um, socio-economic, socio-educational environment and everything. And I believe, I believe that that is a type of house Negroism mm. amongst Muslims. Mm. A, a sort of scholar, scholastic, scholastically referenced house Negroism. That whatever my sheikh is on, that is the issue of the day. And I will go with my sheikh. Oh, my sheikh says that's an issue? Then it's an issue. Even though it might be something regional, it might be a religious aspect they're discussing, but it's not as high up on the radar as it's been placed <clears throat> by these individuals, by these groups, by these entities. This is problematic, and I wanted to connect that to our discussions a fortnight ago, because I think it's very important to do that, because that distraction takes away from knowledge, despite mm. the fact some of us believe, no, it is a knowledgeable disputes that are taking place. They may be knowledgeable amongst the, the scholars who are discussing them regionally, but as they affect us in the West, they are secondary to issues that are hitting us and are confronting us daily. To understand this, you have to go back to what young brother here referred to as the house Negro 
and the field Negro back during slavery. There was two kinds of slaves. There was the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro, they lived in the house with master. They dressed pretty good. They ate good because they ate his food, what he left. <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement, but still they lived near their master. And they loved their master more than the master loved himself. They would, they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would. The house Negro, if the master said, we got a good house here, the house Negro said, yeah, we got a good house here. Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. If the master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house Negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house Negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick. He identified himself with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you came to the house Negro and said, let's run away, let's escape, let's separate, that house Negro would look at you and say, man, you crazy. What you mean separate? Where is there a better house than this? Where can I wear better clothes than this? Where can I eat better food than this? That was that house Negro. In those days, he was called a house nigger. And that's what we call him today because we still got some house niggers running around here. <laughs> this modern house Negro loves his master. He wants to live near him. He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near his master. And then brag about, I'm the only Negro out here. <laughs> I'm the only one on my job. I'm the only one in this school. You're nothing but a house Negro. <laughs> and if someone come to you right now and say, let's separate, you say the same thing that the house Negro said on the plantation. What you mean, separate? From America? This good white man? Where well, you gonna get a better job than you get here? I mean, this is what you say. I, I ain't left nothing in Africa. That's what you say. Why, well, you left your mind in Africa. On that same plantation, there was the field Negro. The field Negro, those were the masses. There was always more Negroes in the field than there was Negroes in the house. The Negro in the field caught hell. He ate leftovers. In the house, they ate high up on the hull. The Negro in the field didn't get nothing but what was left of the insides of the hull. They call them Chetlins nowadays. <laughs> In those days, they call them what they were, guts. That's what you were, a gut eater. And some of you are all still gut eaters. <laughs> the field Negro was beaten. From morning till night, he lived in a shack, in a hut. He wore cast-off clothes. And he hated his master. I say he hated his master. He was intelligent. That house Negro loved his master. But that field Negro, remember, they were in the majority. And they hated his master. When the house caught on fire, he didn't try and put it out. That field Negro prayed for a wind, <laughs> for a breeze. When the master got sick, the field Negro prayed that he died. If someone comes to the field Negro and says, let's separate, let's run, he didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here. <laughs> He 
You got field Negroes in America today. I'm a field Negro. The masses are the field Negroes. When they see this man's house on fire, you don't hear these little Negroes talking about our government is in trouble. They say the government is in trouble. Imagine a Negro. Our government. I even heard one say our astronauts. They won't even let him near the plant. And our astronauts. Our Navy. That's a Negro that's out of his mind. That's a Negro that's out of his mind. Just as the slave master in that day used Tom, the house Negro, to keep the field Negroes in check, the same old slave master today has Negroes who are nothing but modern Uncle Toms, 20th century Uncle Toms, to keep you and me in check, keep us under control, keep us passive and peaceful and nonviolent. That's Tom making you nonviolent. It's like when you go to the dentist and the man is going to take your tooth, you're going to fight him when he starts pulling. So there's scripts and stuff in your jaw called Novocaine to make you think they're not doing anything to you. So you sit there and because you got all that Novocaine in your jaw, you suffer peacefully. <laughs> Blood running all down your jaw. And you don't know what's happening. Because someone has taught you to suffer peacefully. The white man do the same thing to you in the street. When he can want to put knots on your head and take advantage of you and don't have to be afraid of you fighting back, to keep you from fighting back, he get these old religious Uncle Toms to teach you and me that just like Nova King, suffer peacefully. Don't stop suffering, just suffer peacefully. As Reverend Cleve pointed out, let your blood flow in the streets. This is a shame. And you know he's a Christian preacher. If it's a shame to him, you know what it is to me. There's nothing in our book the Quran, as you call it, Koran, teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send them to the cemetery. <laughs> That's a good religion. In fact, that's that old time religion. That's the one that Ma and Pa used to talk about. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a head for a head, and a life for a life. That's a good religion. And then anybody, no one, resents that kind of religion being taught but a wolf who intends to make you his meal. <laughs> this is the way it is with the white man in America. He's a wolf, and you a sheep. Anytime a shepherd, a pastor, teach you and me not to run from the white man, and at the same time teachers don't fight the white man, he's a traitor to you and me. Don't lay down our life all by itself. No. Preserve your life. It's the best thing you got. And if you got to give it up, let it be even Stephen. <laughs> The slave master took Tom and dressed him well and fed him well and even gave him a little education, a little education. Gave him a long coat and a top hat 
and made all the other slaves look up to him. Then he used Tom to control them. The same strategy that was used in those days is used today by the same white man. He take a Negro, so-called Negro, and make him prominent, build him up, publicize him, make him a celebrity, and then he becomes a spokesman for Negro and a Negro leader.